This game really should be running better than this. What is going on with AMD's R9 390 in 2021? This right here is AMD's Radeon R9 390, a graphics card most, if not all, people have heard of. The hot, heavy furnace that's been hanging around in there for a few years now, and if you do have any stories of your own experiences, please do comment down below, as I'm generally trying to get an idea of what people feel towards these cards. And it's also a card that is gradually dropping in price, admittedly very slowly. It hasn't yet reached appropriate levels, but with this behemoth of a graphics card out of its original box, just what are the specifications of this six-year-old flagship? Released in June of 2015, it was more or less a beefed up version of AMD's previous flagship, the R9 290. They did this in a similar vein to how the 280X was a HD7970. The main difference here being, it usually came with twice the VRAM over that of an R9 290. In this case with 8GB of the GDDR5 variety. Based on the Granada Pro variant of the GCN2 architecture, it was second only to AMD's own Fury graphics card, with 2560 shading units, 160 TMUs, and a frankly huge 512-bit memory bus. What it lacked in the Fury's overall power, it made up for it by being a bit of an all-rounder with a lower price and a huge VRAM pool. And talking about that low release price, it cost a mere 300 US dollars or 275 pounds to purchase upon release. Still nowadays, you can find sub 200 pound examples putting this card in a very precarious position, as I was used to these things selling for about 80 pounds over a year and a half ago. So with this increased price premium, is it still worth buying today? Now, just before we get right into the benchmarks, this card has arrived relatively clean. I think it's had new thermal paste at some point, and this is on the higher end of the R9 390 prices, given it's come in its box with nearly all of the parts, and it's got even the display port covers, and DVI covers, and whatever other covers there are on there. So approaching 2022, this card does find itself in a very similar situation to my R9 Fury we looked at a year ago. With those looking at the market today dealing with prices so inflated that they are actually good value despite being really inflated. Most sell for around £100 in poorer conditions, up to £250 with near new in box conditions. Prices are sporadic, with some going cheap and others going for near their release price. See, it gives you two options. Either you can take a risk on eBay where you don't get a warranty, and these cards, a lot of them have been used for mining at this point because they were quite good at it back in the day, and with an undervolt, they still I think they can still turn a profit in certain regions. Or you can go to CEX and get a two-year warranty where if something does happen, you do get your money back. So let's find out today, are they worth the risk as an eBay or Facebook marketplace gamble? Well, I suppose we'll really just have to find out. I'm going to be taking the AMD Fury out of my main PC and replacing with the R9 390, so it's paired with a Ryzen 7 3700X, 32GB of DDR4 clocked at 3200MHz, and I've got plenty of bottom titles ready to test, so we can find out just how well this graphics card handles in the latest and greatest of titles. So on the run up to 2022, is this card worth your money? We're also using the latest stable drivers, as after 6 years, unlike the R9 Fury, this card no longer even receives driver updates, something I'll be touching on later on in the video, as there are modded ones out there. But in reality, you've just bought this card, you've just installed it in your system, but what does that translate to in the benchmarks? Starting off our benchmarks with the infamously good looking Red Dead Redemption 2 which ran spectacularly well even with higher settings and a 1440p resolution. It goes without saying that this game, I'm not very good at capturing it unless I'm capturing off another system with a capture card, so I had to use AMD's own ReLive software, which causes a bit much compression. Either way, if you can ignore the sort of bad capture quality, the game looked fantastic, we were off to a great start, and even with those intensive weather effects, the game still hovered around a perfectly respectable 40 to 50 FPS and felt smooth all the way. Another new release with Star Wars Fallen Order, a game that I've really been meaning to play for a while now. Running with the default high settings, all I did was turn down anti-aliasing a little bit, as we didn't really need it at 1440p. This ensured the game ran silky smooth, and just shy of that 60fps target I was aiming for. 
The use of dynamic resolution could get you that extra 5 or so more FPS if you really want to keep that game at a perfectly locked 60 FPS. I on the other hand are using FreeSync and I thought the game looked impressive and it was a great showing all around and a game that I'm probably going to get around to playing about now. The classic title of GTA 5 of course ran with all the bells and whistles. High or ultra settings used all around and the advanced graphic settings were also used as well. We rarely dropped any frames and the game would even run in excess of 100 FPS when nothing much was going on. It looked great in the 1440p resolution, the shadows looked amazing with that AMD CHS option, and the performance was just amazing. I mean, this is a 2015 title running on a 2015 card, so it's not exactly much of a surprise. I just always like to see this game running regardless of hardware. The latest in the Mountain Blade franchise with Bannerlord also running really nicely. I think the game's received a few more optimizations since I benchmarked it about a year ago, and it was sticking to a perfectly playable frame rate with lots of the settings on high. In a huge battle with the wide os wide ocean wide open grassy plains to really stress things out. The performance remained stable and something I really wasn't expecting on this card. Now, everyone always loves to see BeamNG as a benchmark, and maybe it's because I'm used to an R9 Fury, but I found the performance here a tad sporadic and underwhelming. I know the game isn't renowned for its optimizations, and it is a mainly CPU physics intense game, but that doesn't mean your graphics card's not being used. I did drop a few of the settings down to a medium to achieve this level of playability, and the game did run better. Still, even in those more full maps and environments, the game was running well and was perfectly playable and was a lot of fun. So although it's not as good as my R9 Fury, I can't really fault the game for still running pretty well. Then finally, the newest game on my benchmarking suite with Halo Infinite, which is something we really do need to talk about. See, my own R9 Fury doesn't even have drivers for this game. However, I have never seen a card suffer so much from lack of drivers in years as this R9 390 is only a 6 year old card and as we've seen is decently powerful, but in modern titles like this, the card saw no utilisation because the drivers don't support it. You know, I tried 1440p Ultra, I tried 1024x768 at the lowest settings. It's like trying to run GTA 5 on a Terra scale graphics card. Brief moments of utilisation aren't enough to make up for a game that won't use more than 15% of your graphics card. All around, very disappointing for the game, AMD's frankly lacking drivers, and the owners of this game. Now, the performance was definitely respectable, and fortunately I had access to its closest competitor in the form of my once again very own AMD Fury, and results were certainly surprising. Now, don't believe a lot of the nonsense you hear about the R9 390 being better because it's got 8GB of VRAM. Very rarely did it actually help the card beat the AMD Fury. It did help close the gap in the latest and greatest titles, nearly bring them a degree of parity. Whether or not this will keep up given the lack of driver updates will have yet to be seen, and honestly I'd love to take a look at all the competing cards in this £100-£200 budget segment, but given the rarity of these cards, well just any card in that price range, it does make videos like this a lot harder to make. But still, the performance was interesting and surprisingly capable. It is also worth noting the card has Radeon VCE, you know, the whole Shadow Play NVENC equivalent. But it is, from my knowledge, the second revision, meaning that it isn't great. For recording gameplay through OBS, absolutely fine. But don't think you'll be streaming using the hardware encoding on this card at all. At lower bit rates, it falls apart. At the time, it was falling behind Nvidia's and Intel's own equivalents, and in six years it's taken a bit more of a back seat, especially given the price point it's selling for, because there's a few cards on the market from Nvidia's side that do offer their equivalent and it is better. Moreover, I did actually try some modded drivers, which seem to be heavily recommended from these cards on forums, Reddit, wherever you look about. And while performance remained unchanged, a few titles like Halo did see a performance increase by a little bit. It also stopped AMD VCE working properly for some reason. However, the topic of GCN modded drivers, I can't believe we've finally reached the point where I'm talking about this, is definitely one for a different date, on a different card, of which I do have one in mind and I'll probably look at ordering it for that video very soon. So in conclusion, I don't really know where my opinion stands on these cards. 
The performance is still there six years on. The closest thing I have to compare this to historically though is an 8800 GT. And hear me out on this, it sounds insane. There it was, a budget offering that just kept on kicking even after driver updates had long gone. And the thing is, this card would have been in a sub £50 bargain bin territory, which is where this card, the R9390, should be. See, they're both similar with how well they've handled the modern world, but whereas that 8800 GT fell off in price and graphics cards were getting better and better, we're stuck in a stagnating market where you can't get a graphics card and the prices have gone up. See, performance is still on par with the Polaris series, and only really drivers set it apart. That and VCE, but that never got that much better. I suppose what I have to say is, if you can't find an AMD Fury, these do make a good alternative. But the level you want to go up to would have to be up to you, and you really have to keep an eye on the market for a good one. So thank you very much for watching, hope you found this as interesting and as informative as I have, and good night. A lot of the nonsense you hear about the R9 390 being better because it's got 8 gigabytes of VRAM. Very rarely did this actually bring it. And that was my phone.